Hello, welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. We are looking at the Gospel of John. We have been for uh, 30 programs. This is program number 31. We're in John chapter 10. We're looking at verses 22 to 42, and it is titled, I and the Father are one. When I say titled, I am referring to the edition of the Bible that I like, uh, which is the English Standard Version, and each section is titled. Other editions uh, also do the same, but uh, so it makes it easier for me. So the, the distinct stories are divided up, and I'm easily able to then, you know, distinguish one from another. There they are. So, uh, so again, as I said, we're in John chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 22. This story is, I and the Father are one, are one. Now, if you don't understand that, well, I don't either. And no Christian has ever understood that. It's not a thing that we grasp and say, oh, I grabbed that, I got that, it's easy. No, no, God is... Uh, the creator of heaven and earth, he's creator of the universe. He, we will never understand who God is on this planet. I imagine it will take an eternity for us to get glimpses of the majesty of God. Uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine? We, we just, it, it's hard to believe that there could be such a, a, a being um, like this. But we find in scripture that this is who he is, and it is so very well presented in a way that rings so very true. So anyway, that's, that's what we're looking at. And uh, I admit, I'm sure I'm only scratching the surface as I go through these, but I know I dig a little deeper every year as I work on the material. It's just kind of a, a growing experience. Okay. John 10, 22, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. I have to have, explain this. Uh, you know, you've heard of um, uh, Alexander the Great. And what he did was he spread Greek culture as widely and broadly as he could. Uh, after he died, his generals attempted to bring Greek culture uh, to that, that world that he had conquered. Uh, and one of these was a man by the name of Judas Maccabee. Uh, Judas, excuse me, not, I made a mistake. Um, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. You know, I can't go back and uh, delete that uh, because we don't delete anything. Whatever dumb things I happen to say, well, they just get recorded and that's it. But it's not Judas Maccabees. It was Judas Maccabees who undid the awful work of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. In 167 BCE, he came down and destroyed the temple. But before that, he sacrificed a pig on the great altar. He intended to demolish um, the religion of Israel. And it didn't succeed. There was a revolt. You've heard of the Maccabean revolt, Judas Maccabee. And he and his sons revolted and were successful and defeated this Seleucid king. He was um, ruling up in the area of, of Syria. And in 164 BCE, the temple was dedicated, the new temple, and it became known as this, uh, the Feast of the Dedication or the Feast of Lights. We know it today as Hanukkah, Hanukkah. So, and the big thing was the lighting of the great lamps in the temple. And it was at this time, of course, where Jesus had said, I am the light of the world. So uh, let's begin uh, with, with the passage, verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. Okay, we got that. It was winter. December was when Hanukkah takes place, uh, generally. 
Uh, and it has been estimated that this particular time, I don't know if this is correct, I'm going to say it, uh, I wouldn't put any money down on it, but um, uh, that it occurred on December the 25th, or Christmas Day, oddly enough. But anyway, in December, in any case, Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. In the Greek, it says stoa. It means a porch. It means there were columns and there was a, a roof. Uh, because this would, were, you know, won't get rained on, maybe a little bit warmer, and so on. So there, there he was, walking. So the Jews, and remember, the Jews are the religious authorities, gathered around him. Now, the word gathered in the Greek uh, is a little stronger than gathered. They ringed him. They encircled him. Otherwise, they prevented his leaving. He would have had to charge through the line like a, 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 like a fullback or a running back through a defensive line in football. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Hmm. Well, there had been the signs. We just went through the story of the healing of the man born blind. Before that, we had the, he uh, the healing of the man who was paralyzed uh, from birth. Uh, these signs, these miracles, these wonders, which persuaded a lot of the people that Jesus must be the Messiah because how, and how other could it have happened? Uh, the leaders, the Jewish authorities, they said, well, uh, uh, you're either insane or demon-possessed. They were driven to these kinds of extremes because, see, this was of utmost seriousness. I mean, utmost seriousness. Because if Jesus is the Messiah, we have rejected him, and we could be in trouble. That's one thing. But if he tells them he is the Christ, if he goes ahead and uses the words, well, he could easily be in trouble with Rome. They could go to the Roman authority. They could go, with, go to Pilate. And he said, you know, we got a guy here, and he's got a bunch of his friends from Galilee, and he's got a lot of followers around here in Jerusalem, and he's claiming to be the Messiah because they've had a lot of people do that before. They would rise up against Rome, and they would get ultimately destroyed, these pretenders, um, to being Messiah. So it is very possible they were trying to get Jesus to say something that they could run to the Romans with and say, look, here's another one of these crazy guys. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. Now, I have to say that they could not believe unless God had predestined and elected them to know who he is. Remember the passage, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who believe not. We're blind. I was blind. I've been doing this ministry for a long time. I've come across hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who were blind, and they admitted as much once they became a follower of Jesus. Startling reality, but there it is. It just is, it happens. She says, I told you and you do not believe. Okay, so he's going to try something else. He says, the works that I do in my Father's name. Now, what does it mean, Father's name? It's not words that he's going to say. It means he's empowered by the Father. It is through the gifts of the supernatural through the Father that all these things take place. It's not the recitation of some magical formula which is what magic is all about. And there were Christian magicians who you're even going to find in the book of Acts who thought, well, if I know the name of Jesus, I, I have all this power. I can cast out demons and I can perform miracles. Look at the book of Acts and you see Simon the magician and so on. So the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. You've seen what's happened, undeniable, Will you believe then? He's reaching out to them. It's the paradox of election. We cannot believe on our own, but we have to believe in order to be saved. Charles Haddon Spurgeon referred to it as duty faith. We find this duality, this 
paradoxical doctrine about salvation in the scripture, and you just can't ignore it. Some people will go just way over here, or some people will go over here. You have to hold them in tandem. You have to hold them in parallel. It is our duty to believe in Jesus, yet we can't believe in Jesus unless God gives us the faith. That's a paradox, but it is exactly what Scripture says. Sorry. <coughs> it says, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. That's what I mean. There's the paradox of election. If they were his sheep, they would be able to believe. In verse 27, one of the great verses, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Uh, <clears throat> I could go on for a long time on this. I, it's a rather long passage, and I dare not um, stay too long in any particular place. But um, he, he hears, they, we hear his voice. That's why we read the scripture. We know this is just, this is the word of God to us. I know them because he dwells us, he knows us, and they follow me. Sometimes poorly, sometimes badly, sometimes very good. All, all across the spectrum, you're going to find a Christian. Now he says, 28, I give them eternal life. See, there's the election again. There's predestination. I give them eternal life. He doesn't say, well, <clears throat> um, I, you have the power to believe in me, and you better believe in me. If you don't, you're in trouble. He says, I give them eternal life. We cannot earn it. I give them eternal life. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about Adam and Eve? If they had never sinned, would they have died? Well, many say yes. Some say no. I say yes, that Adam and Eve would have died. They have a shelf life. They were human beings. 1 Corinthians 15.50 uh, says, Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. Just by being Adam and Eve with no sin there, they still would have died. The flesh built in, DNA program. We're going to die. You have to be given eternal life. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. That means the word perish means destroyed. They will never be destroyed. Their life will never come to an end. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. We, look, we, we talk about tulip, T-U-L-I-P. Tulip, total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. P, perseverance or perseverance of the saints. And this is the preservation of the saints. That's the way I like to see it. No one can snatch them out of my hand. We're born again. Nobody can change that. I can't even change it. I cannot change it. The devil can't change that. No human being can change it. Even under torture. And Christians have, uh, have coughed up and said, okay, I'll follow you. Whatever God it is, you, or religious philosophy or political philosophy, yeah, I'll do it. But they've coughed it up and they've denied Christ under torture, the threat of uh, torture of their family and, and so on. And uh, there's a whole history of that in the early church about what to do with those people who uh, denied Jesus under torture. But they didn't get the passage, no one shall snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. We belong to him. That will not change ever, regardless of anything that happens. My Father has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch him out of the Father's hand. He says it twice. He doubles down because he wants them to know. And this, this, this passage has been so wonderful for Christians down through the ages. And today too. Probably today more than ever. More than ever. The fierce drive of having to annihilate people who differ from you in your view of God and what you believe is fiercer now than it probably has ever been in the history of Christianity. Uh, there have been great persecutions. Diocletian, the early part of the first century, sure. But how many Christians died under Mao Zedong? Unbelievable. How many died under Stalin? How many died under Hitler? 
on and on and on. How many die under the, the religious authorities who claim that only Islam is it and you have to have no other God but Allah? It's all going on right now, bigger and harsher than it ever has. But no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. Then he says, I and the Father are one. If you want to try to decipher that, uh, well, good luck. That's not going to be that easy. I and the Father are one. What he is saying in the most general way is, as the Father is, I am. Our nature is that of being exactly the same. My will and the Father's will is the same. My nature and the Father's nature is the same. Our program, our plan, all we do is the same. I and the Father are one. I do nothing but what the Father does and that is, that's how it goes. That's as, about as close as I can do in a couple of minutes about I and the Father are one. Verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Now, interesting to pick up, um, it means lifted or carried. There were big stones. Uh, there was construction constantly going on uh, in the temple at that time. And there were plenty of this material around. So he did... They're again, they were going to stone him. They're so outraged. You can imagine, so outraged. I've seen that kind of rage in my life, in my ministry. I've seen that kind of hateful, murderous rage. It goes on right now. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Huh? He said, okay, you saw the healings. You've seen the healings. You're going to stone me for them now because I did those. He said, many good works. 33, the Jews answered him, it is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself God. Make yourself God. Uh, they figured that out. Uh, they listened carefully, and in their analysis, they have to come to the conclusion that Jesus is claiming deity as the Father is deity. As the God whom they worship is divine, so Jesus identifies with that and does claim that kind of divinity. It is written in between the words, but with his acts and the miracles that he does, it is very clear that that's where he stands. So they have the case of blasphemy. That's even better than having worked on the Sabbath, because that is the only reason, blasphemy, that you could be stoned to death. You couldn't, the, the, the Rome let the Jewish people um, execute those who blasphemed, but for no other reason. So they accuse them of blasphemy. They've gone to this extreme point. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law that I said you were God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do not say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Wow. Try to figure that one out. That, that, is, that is a tough one. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I have this right. I, I, know, I really don't, I'm not positive that what I'm going to say is, is right. The, the constructions in the Greek are very peculiar. And the language that Jesus is using, it could fall into any number of categories. Uh, he could be kidding them. Uh, he could be uh, bringing them to a place where he points out that they are acting like gods themselves. Now, the passage uh, is from the Psalms. Uh, let me see if I can find out where it is. Uh, it's from one of the Psalms, it's Psalm 82, 6, uh, that which are quoting. And in Psalm 82, 6, the reference to God are the judges. Uh, they are the ones who are, are leading the people. Uh, and what 
these judges were doing, they were misleading the people. Uh, instead of teaching them about who their God is, they're misrepresenting God and presenting something other than that. And they are judging the people wrongly to their own profit. But they were called in that time gods because only God could judge. But they were in the place of being judged over the religious community. Uh, the, the, these weren't the Pharisees and the Sadducees at that point. Uh, it would be hard to say exactly who they were, except very likely they were the, the, those people who dominated the temple worship, uh, those people, and they were taking advantage of the people. We find that in many places in the scripture. And, uh, but yet they were called gods. And so my own view is uh, that here they are accusing Jesus of blasphemy, um, but they themselves are acting as gods and they are judges who are leading the people astray, who are garnering the worship from the people for themselves and for the betterment of the temple uh, and not for a true worship of God. I mean, they're going to kill somebody because he healed somebody on a Sabbath day. Now that's, that's about as unrighteous and as unholy as you can get. So with all the background of the story, and then we come across this where Jesus brings this up. He said, if he calls them gods to whom the word of God came, scripture cannot be broken. Do, do you say of him whom the God, Father consecrated to send to, into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God? Well, He's turning it on the head, completely turning it around and pointing out to them the fact that in their leading the people astray of denying who Jesus is and terrorizing people, sending them out of the synagogue if they were to identify or say that Jesus is the Messiah, that that's what they're doing. That's about as bad as it gets. And so this is my view of what Jesus is saying. I admit that it does not come across very well in the English. And uh, this, that passage there about ye are gods uh, caused me more grief and time spent than anything else uh, that I've looked at in some time. And uh, I gave you the best I got on that. I hope it... Uh, is fairly accurate, but I have no real way of knowing. Verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, now if they say, well, no, you're not doing the works of the Father. You mean healing a man paralyzed from birth or healing a man blind from birth? These aren't the works of my Father? Then do not believe me. Okay, if you are going to attribute them to some demon possession or I am doing some kind of crazy trick pulling on you, well, if, if that's what they think, do not believe in me. Now, as I spent time trying to figure this out, I think to understand it well, you'd have to have seen Jesus and heard his voice. You've heard me say this many times. My opinion is that what he just said, if I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe in me, I think is said as a lament. He was sad. Jesus was coming up against stone cold unbelief. And from the very people that were supposed to be the guardians of the God of Israel and the whole cult of Israel, 38, but if I do them, and here's where I think Jesus' voice drops. He looks around, but if I do them, and the if is, and I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. He uses this term, I and the Father 
the Father is in me and I am in the Father, as another way of explaining what he means by I and the Father are one. Jesus has, is continuing uh, pounding on this, trying to express to them who he is. Now, I don't understand it today. Those people are not going to understand it today. I don't need to understand it, but I believe it. How could anybody understand who God is in the mind of God completely and utterly so that you could say, yeah, I know God. Oh, yeah, I got, I got that down. I'm an authority. Run for the nearest exit. <laughs> Verse 39, and they th sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Now, they would have dropped the stones. Remember, they've been carrying stones in their hands. Jesus is facing a mob that is ready to kill him. Ready to kill him. And I think that understanding that, it gives you a better understanding of how it is that Jesus may have been speaking to them, how he was looking to him, looking at them, the posture that he had, the loudness, the softness of his voice, the look in his eye. They were holding the stones ready to kill him. But that, it says after that, after, again, they sought to arrest him. They, they're not going to try to stone him now. They dropped the stones. But it says, but he escaped from their hands. I wish that uh, the scripture had been a little more um, graphic and tell us how that worked. Are they trying to say that a miracle occurred here? Probably not. Probably a large crowd, and he just slipped through their hands. Uh, he just went away. Uh, his followers were there. They probably saw the danger. Uh, maybe there was a little bit of upheaval and a lot of movement and thrashing around, a lot of noise. And suddenly, Jesus was no longer there. Verse 40, he went away across the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he remained. That's Perea, Transjordan, across from the Jordan. Uh, where John the Baptist was, and Jesus had spent a long time. It is thought that Jesus spent several months there. Verse 41, And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. There was a whole group of followers of John still there. I believe that Jesus went after them to reach out to them. And verse 42, And many believed in him there. Uh, he had left... John the Baptist, their follower, their leader, had said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is going after some other sheep that are not of that fold. How the stories tie together so beautifully. It's amazing. So long.